So this is the slide that we were still working on uh, last time. Today is Tuesday, January 16th. We're in Chapter 04, Basic Electricity, and I'm telling you that the test is going to be on Tuesday next week. The test is going to be on Tuesday next week, but it's only going to be on Chapters uh, 1 through 3. Quiz on Monday for everything that we cover this week, which will be most of electricity stuff. We, we did a little last time. But the test on Tuesday, it's closed book. You don't get it. You don't get any notes. And it's only on sections one, two, and three. How to pick mechanics, shop safety, and maintenance records. Maintenance, uh, ma federal aviation regulations. Does anybody have any questions about what's going to be on the test on Tuesday? Yeah, yeah, just the stuff we covered in class. Question, Brendan? Uh, there will be very few multiple choice. And tomorrow I'm going to get you, I'm going to hand out a hard copy of sample FAA questions. And that will give you uh, six days to look at them as well. And those will all be multiple choice. But th that's going to be, that's going to be like between a third and a half of the questions are the FAA questions. The rest of them are the ones I, the rest of them will look like quizzes. Is that for the gas you spent to drive here yesterday to come for sim class? After Josh told you that we were having sim class and you drove your car over here, no, nobody was here? Okay, all right. Yeah, no? Oh, okay. All right, I'll try to remind you. So, electricity, we talked about direct current. DC, uh, the last we left off, we were looking at this diagram right here. And uh, when the battery is discharging, when the battery is discharging, electrons leave the negative side of the battery, that's the flat side, and they try to go to the positive. That's the red uh, stuff that we've got going on here. Let's see. So here's the negative side of the battery. Electrons are trying to get to the positive side. We close the switch to allow electrons to go through this light bulb. Some energy gets used up. The electrons all go to the positive side of the battery. So in this case, the electrons are all going in one direction. As the battery is discharging, as the battery is draining, electrons only go in one direction. So in a DC circuit, a direct current circuit, that's the definition of a direct current, direct current is where the components inside of that system, electrons only go through it in one direction. So this light bulb is only going to have electrons going through it in one direction. Think about a stereo in a car. What if you hooked up that stereo backwards? You hooked it up opposite polarity. So you took the negative side out of the stereo and hooked it up to the positive side, the red side of the battery. What ha would happen? It would fry. Yeah, you could go to Fry's Electronics and buy a replacement. Do they have Fry's Electronics in Fresno? Okay, they got them in Phoenix. In any case, yeah, you'd fry it because it's designed as a component. Stereos and small aircraft radios run off a direct how to hook the positive side up of the coming out of the radio to the positive side of the battery, the negative side up to the negative side, because the component is designed to only have electrons go through it in one direction, otherwise it won't work. And in the case of a stereo or an aircraft radio, it'll probably fry it. That is, electrons will go through it in a manner that it was not designed, and it will emit smoke. And stop working. Okay. Alternating current. won't erase everything. Okay, so let's see if I can go back on Because I saved it now, because I'll have to go forward. Okay, let's not worry about that for a minute. Don't worry about alternating current. Alternating current is where the electrons go in one direction half the time, and they go in the opposite direction half the time. This is what comes out of a household electrical circuit. Neither one is positive or negative. Whatever that component is runs off of alternating current. For instance, let's just say that this is a phone charger. The input to it is 110 volts AC 
and the output is about 5 volts DC. So you've got to have something inside of this box that reduces the voltage from 110 volts down to 5 volts. And then you've also got to change it so instead of the electrons going back and forth, back and forth, to where it just goes in one direction. Literally, what's going into this power supply, the symbol for an alternating current generator, is a circle with an AC sine wave in it. And you're going, AC sine wave? Mr. Johnson, I've never heard of an AC sine wave. Well, you have today. An AC sine wave, if this is zero volts, starts out at zero, and it goes up, and it goes down, and it comes back up again. And so this length of time right here, this is one cycle. Household current going into your house, it may be 110 volts AC. Go ahead. And it's 60 hertz, which is the same as 60 cycles per second, or cycles per second, and that's not the same as Child Protective Services. Do they call that in California CPS? In Arizona, they call it CPS. I can't tell you how many times CPS has come to my house. Huh? Why else would CPS come to someone's house? You know, think about it for a little bit. In any case, um, what's occurring is in alternating current, so this is AC here, and this, if this is a wire right here, during this period of time right here, the electrons are going in that direction. During this period of time right here, the electrons are going in this direction. In household current, since it's 60 cycles per second, this one cycle occurs every 60th of a second. So the electrons are going that direction, then that direction, that direction, then that direction. And this happens 60 times a second. So that 12 volt, that car stereo that you have in a car that runs off of 12 to 14 volts, what if you plugged it into the wall? Well, there's two things wrong here. One is the voltage is too high. It's designed for 12 to 14 volts, and hooking it up to 110 volts is going to fry it, as you say. But it's also designed for direct current. So half of the current in this thing is going in the wrong direction. It's also going to fry it, even if it was 12 volts AC. The AC would still fry it. So one of the things about aircraft or automobile or any other electrical equipment is you have to hook it up and you have to power it by the type of electrical power that it's designed for. Is it the right voltage? That's the amount of pressure. And is it the right uh, direction? Is it DC or is it AC? So alternating current, if I drew an alternating current circuit, If I drew an alternating current circuit instead of a battery, I have my AC here, and here's a light bulb, or correction, here's a switch and a light bulb. When I close the switch, that's now closed. That equals on most of the time. Now, electrons are going to leave one side of the battery, go through the light bulb, for, if this is household current, for half of a sixtieth of a second. So this part right there. And then they'd all stop. Right at this moment, that's at zero. No electrons are moving. Then they would go in the other direction. Now they would go in the opposite direction. They'd come out of this side and go in this direction. So you need to make sure that if you hook up, whatever you hook up in that circuit, can it handle the current going this direction and the other, this direction and the other, this direction and the other. Regular light bulbs, incandescent light bulbs, flash light bulbs, those light bulbs are not polarity specific. That is, you can hook them up backwards and they still work okay. So if you had a 110 volt flashlight battery, you could plug it into the wall and even though it was designed to work in a 110 volt DC system, it would work in a 110 volt AC. But most things run off of AC, like fluorescent light bulbs, the ballast inside that powers the bulbs is designed to run off of AC. So most things, you have to hook it up, either AC or DC, and the correct voltage. So most of the things in your life, let me rephrase that. Most of the things in your normal life, 
you originally power or plug into 110 volts AC. But battery chargers in your, for your cell phone, that cell phone battery, it's getting 5 volts. USB, if you didn't know, the voltage coming out of a computer, USB, is just a hair over 5 volts. It's like 5.2. Same thing with a cell phone charger or an iPad charger. There's that charger, you pull it out, and there's that USB plug. It's putting out 5.2 volt, and it's DC. So you got to have something in there that changes the AC to DC, and you got to have something in there that lowers the voltage from 110 down to 5.2. Because batteries, you can't charge them with AC. You got to batteries. You got to charge with direct current. So your cell phone battery. Now, what's really silly is, inside of your phone and inside of a computer, it takes that. It, it, talk about your phone. It takes that five volts DC or so coming off of your cell phone battery, and some of it, the few there that run off of five volts DC, but a lot of the stuff in here, it runs off of AC. So it has to have a device that changes the DC back into AC, because so far human beings haven't figured out how to store AC power. We can only store DC power. Good news is we can change AC to DC and DC to AC. So let's see if I missed anything. Da -da -da, back and forth. So in an electrical circuit, you got to have the source of power. And a source of power, you could also describe it as a source of electrons. Where are the electrons getting pushed from and getting sucked back into? And that's the way you need to think of all types of electrical power, whether it's AC or DC. If the electrons are moving, that means one side of the power source has too many electrons, and the opposite side doesn't have enough, so the electrons are being attracted from where there's too many and going back to where there's too few. And when a, when a battery, when a battery is discharging, that's all in the same direction. AC, the polarity, or the plus or minus of the power supply changes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So you can have a battery, you can have it. When I look at generator here, and this also means a big old alternating current generator in a power station that runs off of coal or natural gas or hydroelectric or nuclear. Can anybody tell me where's the nearest nuclear power plant to where we're sitting? Isn't there one on the northwest side of Fresno? No, probably not. We probably had thought about it. No, there's one on the coast of California. Uh, Palo Verde? Di Di uh, no, it's like the Diablo power plant. They're going to shut it down, or have they shut it down yet? They're not going to keep filling it up. Nice thing about California is there's a lot of hydroelectric. You run water past some fins, and the fins take power off of the water and it spins electrical generator. Did anybody, can anybody tell me where's the nearest electrical generator that runs off of water, hydroelectric? Somebody say Pine Flat Dam. Yeah, that's right. Very good, Brandon. It's Pine Flat Dam. Pine Flat Dam, as the crow flies, is uh, only about 10 or 12 miles from here, maybe 15. If you drive a car, it's probably 20. But it's a, got a hydroelectric power plant. Water goes through it, generates electricity. It's reasonably clean in that it doesn't make any pollution. Of course, some people don't like dams, but we're not going to get into that. So you need a source, either something that's making a generator. Generators typically rotate. So you somehow you got to rotate that generator. So you got to have something to power the generator. Could you spin it around with a gasoline-powered engine? Yes. Could you spin it around with a diesel-powered engine? Could you spin it around with a jet engine? Say yes. Okay, good. Could you spin it around with an engine that's per, that, uh, something that's burning natural gas, that's burning oil, that's burning uh, coal? Okay. So I, I, that's the way generators, you've got to have something to burn or something to spin it. doesn't have to be burning. Okay. Or you've got to have a battery. you also got to have, if I can make this click, You got to have something to use up the electricity. You got to have a load. It could be a light bulb. It could be a motor. It could be a heating element, like in a toaster. How many people in here don't like toast? Okay, remain. Stand up if you don't like toast. Okay, all right. Who do, who likes toast best with butter on it? Okay, who doesn't like butter? Don't.
Don't say you don't like butter because I won't be able to let you stay in my classroom if you don't like butter. All right. So toasters have electric heating elements. Those heating elements, they're designed to get hot. Electrons go through it. Energy is, is uh, released through heat. Yes. You don't like butter? No. Okay, good. Good. I'm glad you like butter. Go ahead. Yeah? There was only one person on YouTube? On the old YouTube. You stuck a knife in a toaster. That's not a good idea. And what happened? The toaster pop, yeah, it caused a short circuit. No, we're not going to stick. Uh, we're not going to stick knives into toasters, but we can have a short circuit. We'll hook up a wire to a battery and see if we can make the battery. Put a grape in a microwave with the same shape as your head. Don't they make grapes sort of the same shape as your head? I mean, approximately, not the same size. You've never seen a grape and said, wow, that's the same shape as my head? Am I the only? Is there anyone in the room, in addition to me, that's looked at grapes and said, wow, that looks like the same shape as my head? Am I the only one that's ever done that? I bet Jaron's done that. Oh, I forgot, Jaron. I didn't sing a song for you. Yes, it's true that I did not. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. So uh, I'm going to hit pause because nobody wants well, I'll say, what the heck. Um, I'll, I'll do the short version. It really has starts with ten bears, but I'm going to go all the way down to three. Let's see if I can remember. Three bears in the bed, and the little one said, roll over, roll over. So they all rolled over, and one fell out. Two bears in the bed, and the one said, roll over, roll over. Rodrigo's looking at me. He's saying he's never heard this song. So, and so the little one said, roll over, roll over. So they all rolled over, and one fell out, one bear. The little one. There's different versions of the song. So, so, does, so is anybody reminding you besides me, Jaron, about your textbook? I, I got your parents' phone number. I could call them. I probably am not going to do that. Okay, so you got to have something to use up the electricity. And then the last thing you got to have is you got to have some conductor. You have to have a way to get the electricity from the source, whether it's a battery or a generator, to the load, whether it's a light bulb or a heating element or a radio or a motor or a fan. Well, I guess a fan is just a motor. So here I'm going to draw. It's going to be a terrible example here. But I'm going to draw the schematic for a battery. Schematic for a battery is two long lines and two short lines. So that's a battery. So just for fun over here, I'm going to write 12.6 volts DC. And the reason I'm writing 12.6 is because car batteries and airplane and helicopter batteries, when they say 12 volt system or they say 14 volt system, that 12, that 14 volt isn't exact. The reason I'm putting 12.6 up here so you'll remember it. If you take a lead acid battery, that is a battery that uses lead plates and sulfuric acid, like the kind found in most cars and the kind found in most small airplanes and helicopters. If it's a brand new battery, it's fully charged, and it's at 80 degrees Fahrenheit because the temperature will impact the voltage, it'll be 12.6 volts. So there's our source. And we have conductor, and I'm going to draw the symbol for a motor. I know this symbol for a motor is really tough. Oh, by the way, I'm also going to put a negative and a positive next to the battery. The short plates are the negative side of the battery, and the positive side is the one with the long plate. So is there anybody uh, uh, that can tell me which direction are the electrons coming out of this battery? Which, one, which side of the battery are the electrons leaving when it's being discharged? Okay, in this case, the battery's right side, your choices are the top or the bottom. They're leaving the bottom side? No? They're leaving the top side? How many people think they're leaving the bottom? How many people think they're leaving the top? How many people are asleep and they don't know? Raise your hand, Jaron. Okay, good. All right. The electrons are leaving the negative side of the battery because for the purposes that we care about, 
we're going to say the negative side of the battery has too many electrons. And the positive side of the battery doesn't have enough. And if you don't have enough electrons, it's like a bat, you're, you're pulling on electrons. Come here, come here, I have a place for you. I mean, they don't actually talk, huh? Yes, if you want to get into some chemistry and physics, you could argue that if there's one more electron on a molecule than there are protons, it's negatively charged, and that's what's on the negative side of the battery. And then on the positive side of the battery is where you have one less electron than you have protons, and that well, those molecules are positively charged. So the electrons are trying to escape from where there's too many electrons and go to where there's too few. It's like going to a crowded beach. You're always trying to go to that spot where there's not very many electrons. Unless they're all scantily clad, and then you might stay where you are. Yes, do you have a story about scantily clad people on YouTube? See how I'm being gender non-discriminatory? Go ahead, Jonathan. By use it by pushing it in at a higher voltage. So, Jonathan, you're bringing up a good point. So can, I, can you give me uh, one minute, and then I'll tell you more about it? So here's this electrical circuit. There's too many electrons on the negative side of the battery. They're going to go through the electric motor, and they're going to go into the positive side of the battery. So what that means is that this electron will go all the way around, and it'll fill up where there's not enough. And as the battery is discharging, this electron will leave, It'll go through the wire, and it'll fill up this hole. This electron will leave, go through the motor and the wire, and as you can see, at some point, there's not going to be any more electrons, and there's not going to be any more space for electrons. And at some point in here, there's nothing left, and now the battery's dead because there's not too many electrons on the negative side anymore. And there's not too few electrons on the positive side, yeah? Right. So to answer Jonathan's question, if I was going to charge this battery up, because it was a chargeable battery, literally, I would take something. Let's just say, for instance, I would take a DC generator or a battery charger. And I would hook it up to the battery. But here's what's interesting. This is negative and this is positive. And this would shove electrons onto the negative side and it would suck them off of the positive side. So this is where there's a little bit of a paradox. Batteries are only used in DC circuits but to charge a battery, you've got to shove electrons in in the opposite direction that they normally come out of while the battery's discharging. So if you, put, uh, you have a rechargeable battery for your remote control airplane, you're going to shove it into uh, some kind of a battery charger, and it's going to shove, it's going to pull the electrons out of the, the positive side and make it more positive, and shove that electron on the negative side and make it more negative. And now the battery gets charged. It's better to recycle them because they have heavy metals and acid in them. So that it's better if you take them to a recycling location so we're not putting that into the ground. Because technically, it well, not technically, it's polluting the ground. It's not against the law to put a battery in the trash, but it's better to recycle them. Question? There are some kinds of batteries where if the battery gets too hot, then it'll start melting the, the insulation, and the positive side will touch the negative side, and now the electrons will really go when an electron can, can do that, and now it'll get hotter and hotter, and it's hot enough that anything, let's put it this way, if it gets up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit and paper catches on fire at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, It'll catch anything nearby that's made out of paper. It'll catch it on fire. Technically, it could get hot enough for the plastic on it to melt and vapors come off of it. And if there's an ignition source, which maybe there is, if electrons are going somewhere they're not supposed to, you have a little spark. The spark could ignite the vapors coming off of the plastic, and now you have a full-blown plastic battery fire. 
So the only time that's going to happen is if something's wrong with the battery. But lithium I lithium batteries, when you go on the airlines, you're not supposed to put them in your checked baggage. You have to take them with you. So in case they catch on fire, you can do something about it. Because if it's inside the cargo hold, nobody will know. And there's actually a maximum amount of lithium batteries you can take with you on your carry-on. I know because I looked it up and I bought the biggest lithium battery that you could carry. Because I have sleep apnea and I wear a breathing machine at night and I like to go uh, backpacking and on trips where there's no electricity and I can plug it into this big old battery and I wanted to buy the biggest one that the airlines would let me take. I went to this, name, name this country. What's, no, close. It's a way smaller. It's an island. No, it's an island. It's way smaller than Australia. No, no, Hawaii is not a country. It's a state. And this only has one island. No, Cuba Cuba's longer and it has more than one island. No, Guam is the territory of the United States, and Guam looks like that anyway. Cuba looks kind of like that with a couple of their little. No, it's not even close to Australia. No, Hawaii's not a country. I'll give you a hint. It's in Europe. It's an island. It's not Ireland, or Ireland but you're really close. What? Iceland. Yeah. I went to Iceland, and we drove around the country of the land of ice. Yes. So we drove. There, there's, a, there's an 800-mile... There's an 800. There's an 800 statute mile road that goes around the, the edge of the country. Most of the time, it's close to the. And we drove that, and so we were camping in a car, and so I needed to be able to use my CPAP machine, even though we were camping out in the middle of nowhere. You could, but uh, if if the car wouldn't start the next morning, you might be unhappy, especially if there was no cell phone coverage. Well, I could, but. <laughs> It would cost a lot of money to ship that. In any case, I bought a lithium battery big enough it would run two nights. So every day in the morning, I'd plug it into the car, and we'd drive around, and it would charge up. So it worked out worked out great. I didn't have a stroke, and I breathed all night. And uh, Anybody ever been to Iceland? Let's see. I had five new species when I went to Iceland. I mean, I ate five new animals that I had never eaten before, <laughs> that I'd never eaten before. I had the egg of some kind of cliff seabird tastes very salty and I had uh, uh, let's see I ate, I ate horse for the first time I had I had some no they don't have ostriches in Iceland these were all native to Iceland well not native horses aren't native I had reindeer and I had a uh, whale I had a mink, minky whale they're not on the endangered species list and then that's what they told me and then uh, and then there was this other kind of seabird tasted like I was eating Really salty fish, because that's all it did. It ate fish out of the ocean. The horse was awesome. It was a great steak. It was great. And, and it ta- they put gravy on it, so it, it was, it was, it, the texture was like cow. But they put, so much, they put gravy on it, so I don't know what it tasted like. Most of the time, I just ate salami and cheese and celery, because we were hiking and stuff. Did I answer your question about charging batteries, Jonathan? All right. All right. So there's three things. I've been talking about voltage and talking about electrons, so I want to dive into that here. There's three things you got to know if you want to talk about how much electricity there is inside of a circuit, how much electricity there is inside of a wire. And there's current, and there's voltage, and there's resistance. The first one we're going to talk about is current. Current is a measure of how many electrons are moving. It's not how many are in there. It's how many are moving. Because if they're not moving, you don't have electricity. You know, I'm trying to stay away from too much physics. And that right there is a capital letter I. I equals amps. Sometimes I'll do a capital letter A. So I don't care what you do. I'll, in any case, you can call it a lot of different things. You can call it current. You can call it amps. The long word is amperes. Nobody ever calls it amperes. I'm not going to ask you that. We already talked about electrons go from when there's where there's not enough electron where there's too many electrons rather to where there's not enough. That's why they go from negative to positive because electrons are negatively charged.
let's say you're flying a PA-38 Tomahawk, and you look in the pilot operating handbook, and it says that airplane burns setting. At cruise setting, you're doing 100, you're doing 90 knots. Woohoo! You're hauling some serious speed there, and you're burning six gallons an hour. If you had a device on that aircraft on the fuel system, you could have a gauge, and it says six gallons per hour. It's measuring a volume of fuel and how many volumes go past it in an hour. So if six volumes of gasoline go past it in an hour, then the gauge of the needle would be on six gallons per hour. So this is a rate. It's happening across a certain amount of time. And you don't need to write this down, but it's like 6 times 10 to the 20 electrons per second. So that's like gazillion, 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 gazillion. Out of electrons, going past one spot every second, that's what one amp is. It's a measurement of how many electrons are going past a certain point in a certain amount of time. If you use, there is an analogy that can be used about electrical systems being very similar to water systems. And there's some similarities and there's some things that aren't the same. One of the things I don't like about electricity is that it's difficult to understand electricity because you don't get to see much of it. Sometimes you can see some of the impacts of it, but you can't. It's very hard to put electricity under a microscope and see the electrons. If, uh, just like a gallons per hour meter on an airplane, you could put a gallons per hour meter on water. And in fact, if you owned a house outside of the city, out in the country, and you had a well, you, could, you probably have a water pressure gauge somewhere. But you might also have a gauge that measures that house. In order to sell that house, somebody's going to have to come out and measure the output of the well pump. And literally what they'll do is they'll have like a five-gallon bucket, and they'll turn on the faucet right now. And then they'll how many gallons in a minute? Multiply it times 60. So if you get two gallons of water in a minute, that means two times 60, or 120 gallons an hour. So that's measuring a rate of some volume across a certain amount of time. Just like electrons, amps is a certain amount of amp, a certain amount of electrons across a certain amount of time. You need a complete circuit for electrons to move. So if I put this battery in here again, this time I'm going to put a switch. I guess I've put a switch before. And a light bulb. If this switch is in the open position, and that equals off, then the electrons can't travel through the circuit. So this is called an open circuit, and the electrons aren't going to move. If I want the electrons to move and go through the light bulb, I have to close the circuit. I have to have a closed circuit. So if I chank, move this switch to the on position, That's now on, and that, that's now closed, and that equals on. So now I have a path for current to flow, as we've shown in, in previous slides here. Now electrons can leave the negative side of the battery, and they have a path to travel to get back to the positive side. So amps won't flow, electrons won't move. If you pull the wires apart, or you cut the wires, or you open the switch, the electrons won't move. That way we can be in control of it. So we're going to take a break now until 25 after. 25 after.